Hey everyone, how's it going? We have a new live stream. I'm excited. I'm excited and nervous. I'm always nervous. <laughs> Not because of the streaming or the coding, but because of all the tech that I need to do this live stream, the OBS, the shader toy website in the correct WebGL mode so OBS can capture the WebGL content, which requires me going to settings and all those things. And then Chrome has to have the right settings and the mic has to be plugged and the levels have to be right. And <laughs> all those things are so much more complicated than writing a new occlusion function or something for Shader Toy. So uh, today I was planning to take over um, or resume uh, that shader that we left unfinished that was pending, which was the gears, uh, spherical gears shader. And that's because I got a few people asking like, hey, what about we finish it and we do the lighting and uh, all the things that, you know, need to happen to take the, the shader to the finish line and all the retouching and fine tuning of colors, materials and all those things. Uh, what else? Let me see. Some mathematics. We will do some derivations on paper again, just as we did for the first part of the spherical gears. We will do some motion blur, optimizations, these kind of things. All right, so let's go ahead and start coding some things here. And this is where we left it last time. Uh, we had this, I think it's um, 18 gears rotating. Um, if you remember the stream that we did uh, for the first part of this development, um, I had some issues where some of the gears did, didn't rotate in the right direction. Um, I messed up a few things, but I didn't want to spend much time today just fixing all those uh, minus signs and XYZs versus CYXs and all those things. So I just went ahead and before starting today the stream and just I just fixed all the things that were broken from the previous stream, which were not many actually, it was just a couple of things. Um, so this is the final code for the 18 gears. And as you know, due to symmetries, we are only evaluating four of them. Uh, it's not like we have 18 times the SDF of a gear that I instantiate. We only have four of them. And then we use different symmetries and reflections to you know, evaluate only the four um, gears um, that need to be evaluated. So we can, you can check the previous live stream if you want to learn about those symmetries and reflections. The video is there, but yeah, so that's it for us already. I'm going to stop the rotation so we don't get dizzy and also we don't burn the GPU, which right now it's streaming and compressing and shader, shader toying. So let's go ahead and do some lighting because all we have so far is that bit of ambient occlusion that I added, which was your traditional uh, sign distance field based ambient occlusion, which is this guy here. So if I replace the ambient occlusion just by nothing, you will see that um, um, you will see that the, the lighting is gone, the darkening is gone, but if I put the ambient occlusion back, I get some darkening in the, I guess, concave areas of the geometry, those parts of the geometry that are less exposed to the environment and therefore are probably going to receive less lighting. So it's a Basically, this occlusion computation is just a concavity measurement. It's a very simple one. I think it's using eight samples or something. Let's have a look. Yeah, five samples. It's right here. It's measuring the SDF in a few locations around the point of interest, the one that we are shading. And based on how those, the distance evaluates in those points compared to the distance we are from the surface, you kind of, kind of, you can guess the amount of concavity on that geometry. And we are using just that for darkening. Um, similar to the hacker that we coded uh, last time, we, here we're having exactly the same issue and that's why I'm going just to fly through it instead of stopping too much into the details of how to improve it. But we have the issue where this computed procedural occlusion computation or concavity, it can only measure basically concavity. It can only measure near concavities. Um, it doesn't really explore too far into the scene and it cannot capture occlusion or shadowing from objects which are too far. Uh, so a gear, in this case, one of the uh, tooths of one of the gears could be casting a shadow on the neighboring tooth, but not casting any shadow 
to the tooth that is like five or six positions um, away. So that's a problem because it does capture a bit of occlusion, improves the realism and the contact shadows. When two gears touch each other, you will have a darkening, which is great. But we don't have the darkening, for example, in the center of this structure where, you know, there's all these other, there are these other 18 gears rotating around and therefore the amount of light that should reach the center of that structure where we have that sphere should be very minimal and it should be pretty dark. But this occlusion computation cannot capture that. So we will fix it instead of writing a second uh, occlusion computation with a far uh, farther or, or a larger occlusion distance, which we could, but that would be difficult to tweak. We are going to just fake again the occlusion. We are going to paint it by hand. And as I was saying, or advocating for in the other video, that's fine by me because this is not a game. This spherical gear is not going to be located in any arbitrary location based on gameplay or whatever the user is going to do, but we are designing where it goes, pretty much like in a film. Like this object goes here, the camera is there, we know it in advance, we can tweak for that one location. So we are going to tweak and uh, create some occlusion, which I'm going to call fake occlusion. I'm going to put it there and then here we can multiply by fake occlusion uh, such that whatever we paint by hand, whatever shadowing we paint by hand will be combined with the computed occlusion. And we can multiply or we could use a mean evaluation, you know, if there are two shadows, one coming from computation, the other one painted, and both shadows overlap in a given point in space, meaning that point is in shade or shadowed by both uh, computations or both shadow occlusions, then when, how do we combine those two? Which one of them does win? So the mean would work probably. Uh, in my, in, that works well for direct lighting, but for occlusion, I normally find that multiplying gets uh, gives us a bit better result. And the, the, the idea is that because it's not a shadow, it's really an occlusion, it's an average amount of shadow. Uh, an occlusion means how much percentage of the environment uh, is visible from a given point. So if you have two percentages, uh, chances are that you can multiply them together to get um, a more accurate result. Like if something is occluded by 50% and some other thing is occluding another 50%, probably you are going to get only 25% of visibility. Anyway, so the first thing to do is um, I want the interior of the uh, structure to be darker. That's the main offender here. Like that, that's the thing that when I look at this picture, uh, the, the first thing I don't like or the first thing that makes it confusing for me to read this image or understand what's going on is that there, has, is that there is too much stuff going on. And that's due to the amount of detail here, right? There is all these T's and, and pivots and spheres and little things. And um, in reality, you wouldn't see that much. Everything in the interior would be dark and you would be focusing only on the gear. So that's what we want to achieve, not only for realism, but also for a more from an art direction perspective, where we really want people to look at the image and understand what's going on and like it right away without having to spend five seconds or 10 seconds staring at it before they understand what's going on. So um, to me, the easiest way is to take, um, to basically segmentate or isolate the interior from the exterior. There are, we have another two ways. The first one is um, taking all the surfaces that are pointing inwards and considering them or making them darker. So anything that is facing outwards, it's gonna be brighter because most likely it's gonna be part of those gears that are making the surface of the structure and those are exposed to the environment. So they are gonna be bright. And everything facing inside, meaning the back sides of the gears um, are gonna be darker. So we can measure that orientation just by taking a dot product between the normal of the surface and, and the position of the point that we are shading. So yeah, let's, let's do that. So if we take uh, the normal and then, you know, when the normal is aligned, it's pointing outwards and we can create an outwards vector by taking the point um, and connecting it with the center of the structure. If those two things are aligned and they would always be aligned in a perfect sphere, you know, like the normal of the sphere and the vector that goes from the center to the point where the normal is, those two things are the same. In this case, because there is gears and geometry, those things won't be aligned, but the more aligned they are, the more outwards um, the surface 
uh, is looking to. So we are gonna take just the position of the normal and yeah, the no normalized position and then dot it with the normal. And that would give us one when things are facing outside, would give us negative one when things are uh, facing inwards. Uh, we don't want negative occlusions, we want uh, zero occlusions, well, I guess zero exposure or, uh, yeah, normally I use occlusion, but I use the signal like in the reversed way of occlusion. I, I talk about occlusion, but I'm, I guess I'm always thinking of exposure instead of occlusion, but anyway. So if we take the negative one to one signal that we have and we, where's my keyboard here? And we offset and bias it, scale it and bias it by a half, we will make the negative ones become zero and the positive ones become one. And we can clamp it just in case we made any precision issues. So that it, there it is. So that's our first um, darkening effect. So I'm gonna enable it and disable it. You can see the outer surfaces are still lit by the same amount as before. They are equally lit, but the inner parts are getting darker. So that's great. I can already read the image a lot better. I can understand way better what's going on there. It might be too dark, as in those back uh, back sides of the gears at the other side of the structure are a bit too dark. You would always you would still expect to see some light leaking inside. So that value of zero there, it's a bit too extreme. So we can always you know like again leak some light in there by biasing a little bit of. Uh, light. Ideally, instead of you know clamping to zero one and then adding a constant, we could get a bit more of a a bit more rich uh, lighting if we were doing that operation here. Something more like um, something like this, where um, again when things are negative or when this dot product is negative one, uh, we are still going to get zero point one. And when the dot product is one, we are still gonna get one. So it's never zero, it's still 0 0.1. But in this case, we did the multiplication um, before the clamp. So actually we can't remove the clamp completely. So that will give us some smooth occlusion where otherwise we would have a flat transition. And the other one that we can use is that, uh, is that of darkening based on distance, because in this case, I am not liking that we can't see the inner sphere at the center. It kind of doesn't f like fit well with the rest because I would expect some darkening to happen in there. Not only expect it, but now that I have a visual uh, help of that occlusion because of the thing we just wrote down, I can't see the back gears being dark and it doesn't make sense visually that the sphere in the center is not slightly dark. So we, are, we can just do something where we take, um, you know, oh, two lengths. I don't need two lengths. You know, we measure basically the distance to the center, and we could do something where um, things closer to the center are darker, darken, and those in the outside are brighter. But I am darkening the outside too much, and I think it's because my sphere has a radius of 0.5 or something. I think it was 535, if I remember well, from last night. So we can normalize it so that the distance exactly at the location where the outer gears are, that becomes the 1.0 occlusion or, or exposure. And everything in the inside is, you know, uh, zero. Luckily, we don't have anything exactly at, at, at the origin. Uh, that sphere in the center is slightly bigger than it has some radius to it. so. We will never get exactly black, but actually, even now it's not bright enough. I think we can add a bit of light there. Okay, so there we go. Uh, let's see how this looks with and without. All right, I think that looks great. Okay, so what else should we do? We have the occlusion. Um, we can play a bit with the look now and start doing lighting, I guess. So the first thing I'm going to do is to simplify a bit the amount of texture. It feels too like we have too much grain and contrast in that metallic texture that we added. Um, so this thing I'm doing here, I was taking the texture 
value and squaring it, knowing that by the end of the shader we would go we would do gamma correction, which kind of square roots the colors. So this was a way to kind of do inverse gamma, knowing yeah, knowing that we would square it afterwards, so that we would get so that in the screen we would get the same colors as we have in the texture itself. But in this case, even though that's kind of the right thing to do, I am not liking it because that texture has too much contrast. So I'm just going to remove that and then I guess lower the lighting here. Um, okay, then it's fine actually. All right, so let's start doing some lighting. The idea of this shader was to make something metallic. And what we have so far is just basic white light uh, rig, which is great for modeling and and finding your way through the maths and the SDF of the composition. But now we are going to get rid of this and we are going to start doing proper lighting. So the way I like doing it is one light at a time. We start with black and then we are going to uh, say this is our first light and I'm going to call it top light because I'm going to put a light at the top. Um, this is something I, you know, normally I have this always like two or three lighting rigs that I keep using over and over again. When I'm doing a uh, outdoors scene, I always have, you know, like the dome light, which is like the overall blue ambient light coming from everywhere, or at least from the upper hemisphere, which represents the sky. And then I have a strong key light, which I make yellow and very directional, which is the sun and then some bounce light and, you know, all those things. I already talked about that a few times. Um, so that's outdoors lighting rig kind of thing. It's a good starting point to keep going and um, fine tune for your particular shader. There are a few others, but this is um, more, this one I uh, I liked it and I learned it from Otavio, Otavio Good, uh, one of the shader producers and a friend who realized that when you have something metallic and shiny in isolation, uh, meaning not in an environment, but just in a neutral background, which is the kind of thing you see in a car um, ad, you know, when BMW is making a, a, a shiny advertising for their next car, that's kind of the setup, you know, gray background, the car there with a lot of specular reflections and everything. And in that case, that studio lighting is based on a big um, square area light that they put above the car. Um, it's not a punctual light, it's not like a point light where it would create very sharp um, reflections and specular highlights. It's not ambient lighting, which kind of makes it all look like, like you know, it's a muddy, uh, overcast day. It's really an in-between thing, it's a big area light, and that's what we are going to try to do here. We are going to put a big square area light on top and um, see what it looks like. And by that, of course, I mean... <laughs> We are going to pretend we are putting in an area light. We are not going to do the right thing here. We are, we are not going to cast a lot of rays uh, to a big area light because we cannot afford that if we want to, this to run in real time on a mobile phone. We are not going to do some analytic inte integral of you know square lights or anything like that. We are going to totally fake it, but that's fine. So um, every light has always like you know like a, a diffuse and a specular component to it. So let's start with the diffuse. Um, it's going to be, in this case, because the light is above, um, all we need is just the dot product between the normal and the up direction, in which case, because the up direction is 0, 1, 0, we don't even need to invoke the dot product function. We know the dot product is just the Y component of the normal. And yeah, I'm going to, uh, again, scale and bias it by 0.5 so that anything pointing down gets zero light and everything pointing up gets um, full light. And the top light, I'm going to make it slightly blue. Uh, not for any particular reason other than why not. OK, so that's our light. Um, it's definitely, definitely too bright. So let's make it, because this is just a small ambient light. And remember, this is a metallic structure. So the diffuse response is going to be very low. It's mostly about specular highlights, but and because I don't want to cast shadow rays right now towards the light source to make everything cheap, I'm for now going to reuse the occlusion signal that we built. And there we go. 
let me check quickly the chat. Do, do, do. Did you fix some of the gears? Yes, I did. Uh, line 258 isn't the calculation anymore. Uh, we need to a way to call Inigo's attention on the chat. Yes, that's right. So what's happening in line 258? Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys mean. The computation is the calculation isn't there anymore. Um, if you're referring to the fact that the code changed from the one we left on the previous live stream, that's true. I have tweaked a few things like the gears and all those things, and I have I might have moved things up and down. Um, I also added some comments and things, but um, yeah. So how does the calc ambient occlusion work? Um, yeah, we can explain that quickly. Um, so where is it? It's here. So what it does, okay, you know what? Let me, let me try to paint something. How can we paint here? Is there some online painting tool that I can use? Let me try to find out. Online painting. Okay, I think I found something. Okay, this will do for now. Uh, how do I share this now? There. Okay. Okay. I hope you can see that. Yes, I think you can. So um, I wrote an article about this, actually. If you go here and where should this be? Presentations. So if you go to my website, uh, here, ikilesles.org, articles, scroll down, presentations. I, I know I should organize all this website, by the way, by themes, better than I am doing now in a way that someone who is learning can jump from topic to topic in a way that makes sense. And over time, you, you follow a, an arc and uh, guides you through a process of learning versus now everything is scattered randomly <clears throat> and is organized by date, which doesn't make sense. Like you shouldn't care when I wrote something. It's more about how to learn that. So I, I definitely have to fix this. But for now, uh, if you go down here to the bottom right, presentations, and then 2008, rendering worlds with two triangles. Here there should be a PDF from a presentation of 2008 that they gave on Ray Marching and SDFs in San Jose, California, during an NVIDIA event and a demo scene event. And somewhere here, um, boom, 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 boom. There, is, uh, there is an explanation for ambient occlusion, which I kind of borrowed the basic idea not the implementation and the details of applying it to uh, remarching and SDFs, but the basic idea of measuring concavity to uh, approximate occlusion comes from Alex Evans from Media Molecule these days. So it's here. And this is the drawing that explains how it works. So the idea is, um, I hope that is big enough. So, I mean, you can read that one, but let me explain it again, maybe by dropping it. So, let's say you have a surface, okay? This is the solid surface of, I don't know, it can be a sphere or a whatever. And we are shading this point. Do I have colors? Yes. And do I have... How do I use this? Gradient patterns, color. Okay. So, let's say I'm shading this point here. So, you know, we found an intersection with it, pink, and there's the point, and we have a normal. So the idea is to uh, generate some points. In this case, we are generating, if I go back to the code, we are generating five uh, points, and that's why we have this for loop. And each one of those points is going to be generated somewhere in the space. Uh, there are many options here. You can put them all aligned to the normal, and that's what this particular version of the code is doing for today but you could i often do this as well but i just put points and then um i would take i would measure two things first the distance from the point to the surface which you can estimate easily because you 
place these points in the space. So, and you decided to point them at one meter or two meters or one centimeter, you are the one who decided where they are. So you know how far they are from the distance. So let's call those distances blue. And then I measure the distance as well to, let's put again gray. You measure the distance to the rest of the scene. Basically you do a, a normal SDF evaluation. So let's say uh, there was another surface here like that and um, another one like that here, another object. And these are objects as well. So then when you take measurements to the SDF, every point, every of those points will be reporting the closest surface, right? It will be reporting the distance to the closest surface. Meaning this point here, this is the SDF evaluation. For this one, it's that one. Uh, for this one though, it's that. And for this one, it's that, because that's the closest surface. And for this one, I don't know if it will be that or that, maybe this one. And for this one, that one. So now you can compare the greens and the blues, meaning how far the object is from the point that you are shading compared to how far it is to any other thing. And if those two things are the same, it means that the closest object to that point, it's still yourself. It's still the same surface that you are uh, shading, uh, which that's great because if you are the closest thing to yourself, it means there is nothing else around you, meaning you are probably exposed to the environment and to the ambient light. While if a point is closer to something else than it is to yourself, you know, something that came from you, something that you're shading around yourself happens to be closer to something else, it means there is a lot of stuff around, uh, probably close enough that they are indeed being reported as closest which means that those points are going to be occluded because there is all these other things around. So in this case, this point here, because the green is smaller than the blue, indeed we can deduce that there is something around it that is blocking light. And indeed we have this guy here blocking the light. Same for this one here. The green distance here is much smaller than the blue. And indeed that's a good indication that indeed there is something around, which is this guy here. Uh, this other one, however, the blue and the green are the same. And that's telling us that this point pretty much, I mean, this point that we came from, sorry, this one, is pretty much in isolation. So by measuring how many of them report having occluders around versus which ones, how many of them report not having occluders around, you can do an average and have an estimated, estimated occlusion value. So that's what we are doing here, where if I go back to the code, we are generating all those points, in this case, with a uh, 0.12 units of maximum distance and then we evaluate the SDF and we compare the blues to the greens by doing this subtraction here H minus D H is the one we designed the blue one D is the measurement the green and then we add them together and yeah that's a, an average um, there are some hu uh, hidden terms like the average would be done by dividing by 5 and then this constant would become 15 but I simplify things around. This is also a scale factor to kind of give less importance to those samples which are further away, but that's a detail and doesn't matter too much. Um, anyway, I hope that helped a bit. So yeah, that's, um, that's where we are. So let's do now the specular for this top light. So we are gonna do uh, again the same light, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 1.1. .1 times specular and specular. Okay, let's do this. So um, what should we do for the specular? Should we just do like a normal, um, yeah, let's do something where we just reflect. We are going to do normal phone reflection, not even bling, uh, bling phone or anything. Just old school, super old school thing. It will work fine because we want this metallic thing to look pretty much like a, a bit of a mirror. It's gonna have a lot of a mirror quality to it. So just a reflection of what? The ray direction with the normal. So that's the reflective vector. And if that is pointing up or hitting that virtual quad or area light that we have decided we want on top, then the specular will be one. So we can measure the reflection of y and see, um, you know, if the reflection is pointing down, it's not gonna hit the top quad, so no specular, but if it hits it, then yeah, we get some reflection. But that's still too soft because 
that makes it almost feel like the whole dome, the whole sky is a light source, but we want really to focus it on a quad. So I'm going to, or, or a circle or a disk or something, you know, a contained area versus an infinitely big uh, light source. So I'm going to smooth step that, um, I don't know, something like that. This is something I use a lot for uh, sky domes as well, uh, where, you know, only when the rays, reflection rays uh, shooting up, it's going to hit the sky. Uh, so that's what we are doing here. Between 0 and 0 0.1, if it's negative, it doesn't hit anything. But in this case, we don't want just shooting up is enough. We really want the reflection rate to shoot very vertical if we want to hit that quad. So I'm going to make a stronger threshold here. Okay, I'm going to lower the diffuse. I don't like that it's so bright. Okay. So that's great. Here you can see a bit the, the effect starting to take shape. Here you can see a bit the gradient that we have created in different areas. Um, actually, you know what? If we remove the gears for a second, how can I do that? I think I can just return D here. Yeah, that's the inner sphere that we placed in the structure. It's a very good way to check the light. It's like a light probe, almost. So that's our uh, reflection. So we are not putting a quad, we are putting a, a disk. But what I wanted to show you is that by tweaking the parameters of the smooth step, I can make that feel more like a rough uh, surface or a glossy one. So in this case, I'm using a very sharp transition. I could make it even sharper like that. But that would start, sorry, it would start aliasing too much probably if the transition is that sharp. So 0.5 and 0.6 feels like a good trade between sharpness and aliasing. So what was our SDF here? Let me bring all the gears back. There we go. Now, the other factor that we need here is some sort of um, specular fall off, or actually, let me multiply it by diffuse. Normally makes it more realistic. But also, we need um, what do you call in physically based lighting the um, slick, the, no, Fresnel, yeah, the slick approximation to the Fresnel uh, effect or equation, which basically says that uh, grazing angles, uh, at grazing angles, light will reflect more than when you look at something straight uh, to its normal. And in this case, I'm going to totally fake it. I'm going to call it um, what I'm going to call it. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, OK, you know what? Let's just not call it anything and do it here directly. So I'm going to use something inspired by physically based lighting and so on. Uh, so we do know from physics and from 10 years of computer graphics in photoreal and physically based lighting that the, that fall off will make the specular be stronger at the, at the grazing angles, as I was saying. And the fall off between grazing angles and straight looking at something, the way the specular falls off is a power five exponential, basically. And then there is uh, a bias like at, at, at zero angle Sorry, at straight, when you're straight looking at something, you still always have a bit of reflection, and that amount is called normally F0. And for metals, that's a pretty high value, and I'm gonna actually take the color of the material and make that the F0. That's uh, pretty much a good, uh, it's a good ac accurate um, value for F0. The electrics, as they call them, or things that don't conduct electricity or magnetism um, don't reflect the same way, like plastics, boots, skin, whatever. And those have an F seed of about 4%, but metals have it pretty, bi pretty big, anything from 50% to 90%. So I'm gonna use just the color as a value for that, why not? And now we need uh, to measure that, you know, like um, grazing angle versus not. And I think we will do it properly for the next slide source, but for this one, I'm just going to approximate it by uh, regular, uh, edge detection of Fresnel, where everything around the edges of the object is going to be 
um, we are going to consider it a grazing angle. So let me show you that. Uh, I should be able to do this by rd normal. Let me clamp it. And I will explain now in a bit what this is doing. And then I am going to... First of all, before that, I'm going to visualize that signal. Okay, so that's right. We have a measurement of, you know, um, orientation between surface and the camera view, view, view vector or view direction. Um, so that's great. That's a, it's equivalent kind of more or less for our purposes to a measurement of grazing angles between light source and view vector. Um, and this is great because you can use it actually for doing, you know, like X-ray shaders and things like that. If you are pretending you are looking at this stuff from a microscope, that's great. So we will be using that. Um, we will use that to multiply the specular, which I'm going to make it a VEC3 so we can have color. So now let's see, can I, I'm going to have to multiply this by something. All right, that's too much, maybe. All right, so there we go. Maybe a bit less. Yeah, there. So this is without our Fresnel thing, where everything is equally reflecting the area light that we put at the top of the structure. And now this is something that very changes with the. Uh, alignment of the view vector and the light source and the normal. So it makes it more realistic, especially I like what's happening here at the top, where because of that grazing angle measurement, we are getting a lot more reflectivity than here. So that has a very nice feel to it. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is normally, um, you know, the I'm going to do the shadowing of the diffuse on itself, because that same shadowing that affects the diffuse should also uh, affect the specular highlights. So now, yeah, the, high, the speculars are also being shaded. And just like that, this starts to feel already relatively metallic to me. Um, so, yeah, let's keep going. Let me read the chat just in case. Marvin says, good explanation, thank you. All right, I'm glad it worked because like <laughs> explaining those things like occlusion is one of those where I feel like when you know about the SDFs, you are, you are equipped to understand the explanation, but at that point you might already know it. <laughs> and if you don't know about SDFs, it might be pretty hard to follow the explanation anyway. So it's, for me, it's a kind of a binary thing where you either get it or not, but I'm good at it could bridge that transition. All right. So let's add a second light. And um, before I said that I was making this light um, blue for no good reason, but of course there's a good reason, actually. Well, not of course. Normally I say the truth. <laughs> In this case, uh, I was kind of delaying something, which is that I'm going to use a second light source, which I will make yellow. Um, I'm sure I have talked about this many times, but just like in an outdoor scene, the blue, sorry, the sky is blue. And by comparison, the, the, the sunlight feels yellow, even though it's white, um, because our brain always plays this complementary color game where if everything is blue, then whatever is not blue feels yellow, which is the opposite color in the spectrum or in the wheel of colors. We're going to play the same game here and I'm going to make the one of the lights blue and the other one yellow. Just because it looks good to the eye, just because every single poster in a film, in the, in the cinema, uh, in the films, they always have this blue and yellow thing. Uh, if you look at the color palettes, I think I have shown that in the past as well in a stream where, uh, I mean, I'm going to do it very quick just because why not? But if we go here and we Google for film poster and uh, we go here, the amount of blue and yellow, it's, 
it's always crazy. I mean, I can keep opening more. Some of them have variations of the blue and yellow, and they do green and I mean, like more orangey, but that's one. Blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue. Very mute yellow, but if something is not blue, it's definitely yellow or orange. Blue and yellow. I mean, I don't think I need to convince you, but. And there's a reason, it feels good. Human skin, um, at least traditionally in Hollywood, which always make, uh, always use white characters for everything. Kind of orange skin, yellow skin, um, and blue sky. Basically, looks good. Everyone uses it, we are gonna use it too. So we're gonna, I'm gonna call this one side light. So let's be more, a bit more correct for this one. Let's do things a bit more properly. Um, we could do the other one properly as well, we could fake this one as well, but let's do one of each to see both approaches to being pragmatic versus being more um, like correctness driven. Um, so let's do again, let's have a diffuse component and yeah, let's do the normal thing that everyone does. We have a light source, which we are going to place, um, let's say we have one at the top, let's put one on the side to have kind of uh, a good balance. So I'm gonna make it very low in altitude. Uh, so it's gonna come mostly horizontally shooting into the scene. And we are gonna do our regular dot product of normal and light, the end hotel that we all like and love. Uh, and this should actually, I forgot totally to put the material in the color for the diffuse. So actually before we do anything else, let's see how that looks like. Let me add more. Okay, there we go. That's great. I had forgotten in the diffuse component of the previous light to multiply by the albedo of the surface. Like it's normally end of tail times the color of the surface and times the color of the light. Anyway, let's do that again here and see how I'm always additively compounding the different light sources. That's what you want to do. So we're gonna make we are gonna make this light yellow, as I was saying. Um, how much yellow? I don't know. Let's improvise this a bit. And times diffuse. And see how this starts looking. All right, that might be a bit too much diffuse there. Um, and just, well, actually, you know what? Let me keep it high. Because instead of using occlusion to darken that light source, we are going to do proper sh shading, proper shadowing. So. Hmm, I don't know if we have this ready in our framework. Um, let's see, do I have a shadow function? Oh, I have one. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's use it. This one is gonna give us a shadow. It's gonna compute shadows for a given position in a given light direction for a given light source size. And I have to pass time because the whole SDF is animated over time. Um, I time, I guess. All right. So if anyone is interested in learning how to compute uh, the shadows, uh, let me know. I have an article online. It's a pretty standard procedure, but we can quickly go over it. Uh, just shout on the chat. In the meanwhile, let's see what we did. How did this improve? Okay, that's great. It created all the shadows in the in inner part, which I like. Okay, so let's do the specular now. Color plus equals. Um, same stuff times specular. And now, specular, we are going to do the right thing. So instead of using uh, the Fong specular model that we used in the previous one, where we just took the reflection vector and saw if that is hitting the light source or not or if missing it by how much, and that's where the smooth step kicked in, or although normally you would use a power function, power function to measure that by how much I missed the light source. Um, in this case, we are gonna do the Blin Fong model, which is based on the half vector. Um, I'm not gonna explain this, I think, because I'm like super versed on micro facet models. I, I do get them, but I'm not like, it's a difficult topic, but basically instead of taking the 
dot vector dot product between the normal and the light source that you would do for the diffuse you do take the um, dot product between the normal and the half vector which is not the light vector it's the half vector which is the average or the in-between thing between the light vector and the view vector so there's reasons for that it has to do with how mirrors work and so on but one intuition you can have about it is that whereas diffuse is just n dot l and nothing in that equation depends on the view of the uh, of the viewer of the scene of the camera in this case by the half vector being the average of the light source and the camera vector suddenly you are introducing dependency with the view so you need that for a specular not that that explains why that's the right formula but um, can give you maybe some intuition about how things work maybe i don't know uh, for me, the view vector goes from the camera to the object, but if you want to do the average, normally you want to do the, the vector that goes from the surface that you're shading to the viewer. So I'm going to negate it, and that's why I'm calling it uh, minus rd instead of plus rd. So you're adding both, and then you have to divide by two, and then normalize it. But because normalizing, it's already taking or removing all constant terms, like the division by two, don't, doesn't do anything because it's going to get normalized anyway. So you're making something half as long by dividing it by two just to stretch it back to unit length. So we might as well just stretch it directly from the position where we were before division by two because direction won't change. So we have the dot, the half, the half vector. Uh, you can see that I always called all my stuff like three letters, you know, diff for diffuse, call for color, ref for refraction, Reflection, nor for normal, free for Fresnel, spe for specular, mate, mate, material. It's, a, it's four letters. It's an exception because mat is kind of a matrix in the language. And then F occlusion is an exception as well, F2. Actually, I have many exceptions. <laughs> but I try to use three letters also because things align beautifully like that when I put them in the code. So let's do the dot product between the half vector and the normal. Uh, we clap them to zero on one just to make sure that we don't um, create uh, values too much above one that then might explode when raising them to a big power or that we don't have negative values that will subtract color suddenly from our scene when the light is on the other side of the surface or whatever so yeah now we have to raise that to a power uh, should I do it here just directly and what power? I don't know. Let's try 32. That's looking good, kind of. <clears throat> um, let me check. I had some notes I made for myself at some point. Um, where do I have them? Yeah, I don't find them. It's okay, guys. Let's totally improvise as we have been doing. Uh, so, yeah, that's a specular yellow light. Very cool. I like it more red. Let's lower that green a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry. Wrong one. Well, I need both, so why not? Here. All right. And I think what we need as well is some Fresnel again. So let's do the Fresnel thing properly this time. So specular times equals F0. And at the recent angles, it's going to reach 1. So we need this guy to be 1 minus F0 such that when the following thing, which is a POW, reaches value of 1, the Fresnel equals 1, because it will be F0 plus 1 minus F0, which is 1. So we know we want a power of 5 to get physically uh, plausible falloff. And then the thing we are going to fall off is that measurement of uh, alignment between the light source and the camera relative to the view. So we can do the dot product of um the half vector and the light source or the view vector is the same thing and then one minus that um and something didn't go well oh it's because we need to be this to be a vector three it's a colored specular because this is a metal all right uh there we go and um, did i do right that right i think uh, this is gonna be a plus right yeah. It's gonna be a plus or a minus? 
Hmm. Let me think. Half vector when they are aligned. So the half is there when they are perfectly aligned. Zero and one. This has to be a negative, right? All right. Okay. Uh, and now let's take this and crank it up. Okay. That feels great. I think it's, the speculator is too too sharp. Uh, let me let me make that lobe a bit wider and softer. So we lower this to sixteen. Okay. Um, all right. That's great. We are doing progress. Um, I don't like the how much specular there is in the sphere in the inside. So I'm tempted to multiply by occlusion once again to darken that thing. But even if I darken it, I still see a very sharp. Okay, let me let me hide the gears to explain what I'm seeing that I cannot unsee and it's bothering me a lot uh, here return come on, ah, return D we have to return something okay, so that's the inner sphere which I mean, to be honest, it's mostly covered by stuff normally, but so the yellow highlight will go away when we put the rest of the gears, because we are doing proper shadow computations for it. So the gears will be blocking that highlight. We won't see it. Uh, actually, let's hide it by hand for now too, so we can focus on the rest. It's that that is bothering me, that perfectly sharp specular, because even if I dark, darken it to kind of make it less distracting, it's still there, it's very sharp. So what I'm going to do is in the inner side of the sphere, and I think I did, yes, I did this in the final shader, in the one that is publicly available. I took that reflection and remember how we controlled how sharp or smooth it was with a smooth step? Actually, this one here, to be exact. Um, we can um, soften it in the inner side. We can keep it sharp for the outer gears and keep it very smooth and diffuse for the inner part. So we can... Um, so let me see. If I make this negative 1.0, oh, okay. I'm definitely smoothing that out and making it more like a rough surface. It be the specular becomes more of a um, diffuse component somehow. So I like that for the inner core. I don't want that for the gears in the outside. So what we can do is to recover the 0 0.5 that we had by adding 1.5 only when there is a lot of exposure to the outside, which we can measure with the fake occlusion that we just painted by hand. So that same signal is going to help us interpolate between this in the outside. And if I did everything right, and we now enable the gears, we still sh should see a very sharp specular for the outer gears. There it is. So let's go back here. If I put again the 0 0.5 that we had, outer gears shouldn't change. They don't, but the inner core becomes too specular. And now the inner core becomes more diffuse. Now, it's a matter of taste if you want to keep that inner thing very, very uh, specular, but it was distracting to me. So I'm also going to darken it a bit more. So that's great. Now compare that to what we just had. Yeah, too busy easier to read or to see. I keep using the read um, verb, but you understand what I'm saying, right? It's easier to understand the image. Okay. Um, here we are. What else can we do? Um, let's quickly... It still feels like too bright, generally. I'm going to make it more metallic and realistic by increasing the contrast of the whole image and this is something that films do i'm sure games do it's basically it's kind of a color correction step 
but the typical one that happens a lot is uh, an S curve or a sigmoid. Um, different, you know, film profiles from, you know, when the old days for analog films, the Kodak films and the different brands would have their own response curve and things like that. And basically the the darks of the image always stay dark for a long time before they ramp up. It takes some time to ramp up to brighter colors. And then when the more light you put, it doesn't really saturate that quickly. It kind of slowly saturates. So overall, the color profile is some of, sort of an S curve. So I'm going to just um, kind of simulate that with a smooth step, basically. Uh, there we go. So this is a smooth step. It's um, we have talked about this in the past. Um, let me show you. Browser. Smooth step. Oops. I didn't write this. Smooth step. Smooth step. There. It's one of these guys. X squared minus times. You know what? Let's do some math. You guys want to do some math? I want to do some math. It's math time. <laughs> How conveniently prepared. I have the pen and everything ready just in case. I was gonna do I was gonna do some other math today I had planned. I didn't plan for the smooth step, but let's do it. So um reminder, smooth step is something that we want to use to map black to black and white to white in a way that the blacks stay black for a longer time. They very quickly ramp up to normal colors and then when they start reaching white they slowly transition into white. They don't kick white very strongly with a big acceleration kind of, and they don't clamp. They just slowly uh, converge to white. And that's why we need something like this shape where, you know, black stay black, they quickly accelerate and then slowly go back to white. I don't know if you can see my mouse there. Oh yeah, there we go. So I was saying the staying in, Staying in blacks and accelerate and then decelerate again. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, where were we? Here, math. So uh, let me come here. I hope you can still hear me. I'm a bit farther from the mic now. Let me turn it there. Okay. So what do we want? So we want we want smooth step zero one zero one maps zero to zero maps one to one and kind of stays there, goes like that, and then goes like that. Um, hopefully this is the point a half and a half. But the key is that we have this kind of curve and this other kind of curve here, it's totally symmetric. So we have, in terms of math, we have four conditions that we want to meet. One is that the function goes through zero, zero, through one, one. So that's two conditions. Um, so let's call our, this is going to be a function of, so let's go with a polynomial. And we want something where for zero, we get zero as output. When we input a color of one, we get a color of one as output. And so that's two conditions. When you have two conditions, you can create a line that goes between two points. Um, because you, you know, like a point, a line would be a x plus b. So we have two parameters, a and b, that we can play to try to fulfill these two conditions. But in this case, we want more than two conditions. We also want this slowdown and this, uh, sorry, this ramp up and this slowdown here. And we are going to do that by uh, talking about the derivatives of the function, which means that we want the function not to kick in going straight to the destination, which is there. And we don't want the the, the function to arrive to the destination straight from the source. We want the starting point to start moving to the right before it goes up. And similarly, the destination is going to be reached from the left, you know, by having this kind of tangent or derivative. So we want the function to go to the right, slowly go up, accelerate, and then reach the destination by moving mostly to the right versus coming diagonally or something. And those directions are the derivatives of the function. So what we are saying is that the de derivative at point zero, we want it to be horizontal, which is derivative of zero. And the derivative at 
at the dest at the destination. So this is the point x, right? And this is p of x. Oops, p of x. This axis here. The arrival, the direction of arrival is also horizontal. So we have one, two, three, four conditions we want to meet. So the smallest polynomial we need is one with four coefficients, which is a cubic. It's going to be something like a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d. One, two, three, four uh, things we can tweak. For one, two, three, four things we need to fulfill. So perfect match, we can do this. So let's start. Let's start applying the first uh, condition. Uh, p of zero equals zero. So if we replace x by zero, we get uh, a times zero cubed, which is zero, plus b times zero squared, which is zero plus c times x, which is 0, plus d. So we have d, and that needs to be 0. So right away, we know d equals 0. Great. Let's apply the second condition for which, no, the third one, for which we need the derivative. So p derivative, the derivative of p, p prime x, is going to be, if you, if you remember the rules of derivation, exponent goes down for a polynomial. So 3 times ax squared, the grade goes down by 1, 2bx plus c, and d disappears. So d is evaluated at 0, we want it to be 0. So 3a0 squared is 0, 2b times 0 is 0, plus c, just c, and this has to be 0. So there we go, second condition, c equals 0. Right, let's apply the other two. So we got this one already. P of 1 equals 1. So we go here, we replace x by 1, and we get a plus b plus c plus d. But d is 0, so we all, and c is 0. So we get p of 1 equals a plus b equal 1. Again, I just replaced x by 1 and raise it to the cube, to the squared, and 1 times a is a, and 1 times b is b. And then p prime of y, which is the other remaining condition, which is, we come here to p prime, we, replay, we replace x by 1, and we get 3a plus 2b, this equals 0. Alright, we have to solve now these two equations with two unknowns, pretty easy, because from here we know a equals 1 minus b, Right, a equals y minus b, which we can replace there to get 3 times 1 minus b plus 2b equals 0. And this is 3 minus 3b plus 2b equals 0. We move all the b stuff to the other side, we get b equals 3. Right, yes. And if b equals 3, we come back there, we plug it, and we get back a equals what? Minus 2, negative 2. All right. So uh, our final smooth step function is uh, x equals, let's see, negative 2x squared. So I'm just putting the values for a, b, c, d in that one, plus 3. I know this is cube, right? x squared, and I think we can take some x factor outside. Now I'm thinking on how to implement this in code. We can skip some multiplications if we get x squared out of the equation, and we get 3 minus 2x. And this is our smooth step function. All right. Uh, let's go to the code. And so remember, x squared times 3 minus 2x. That's exactly what I wrote here. Uh, you know, well, x is the color in this case, so x, x, 3 minus 2x. All right, so we get our smooth step. And now I want to add a bit more lighting to this thing. Feels a bit too dark. You could get one more extra light. I'm going to light it a bit from below. Um, like, uh, I mean, a justification for this would be like, um, if there is such a strong light above this structure that is creating all these huge highlights, 
chances are that if there is a floor or a surface that on which this thing is sitting or on which we are with a cameraman or whatever, chances are that some of that light bounces back up and hits the bottom of the structure or something. So, I mean, sometimes we don't need that much of a justification, really. You can just add a color that makes things look better. So the light is going to come from down. So we need the dot product between the normal and the bottom direction, down direction, which is 0, negative 1, 0. That's going to be negative normal dot y. So all we need to do, and then I'm going to bias and offset it as usual. So negative normal dot y. And now we just multiply by that. Um, OK. Um, let me do this. I mean, in theory we don't need it. I'm pretty sure my normal is close enough to unit length. But um, let me multiply that by occlusion to kind of hide a bit of the inner lighting. So how does this look like? I think it looks great. Okay. Um, I didn't give it any color, um, and I'm gonna leave it like that. I think I like it. Okay, so we got our uh, lighting. It's pretty, it's good enough for now. Okay, let's do a bit more tweaks. Uh, first thing is materials. Um, I'm going to, it's always a good idea to modulate the amount of specular by the surface detail. I mean, yeah, you know this. I mean, everyone knows this. This is, uh, don't they call it um, roughness map or something? It's basically a way to add variation in the specularity, which helps a lot. So in this case, uh, let's call the amount of specular, let's take it from the texture. Let's take just the red channel of the texture and use that to control how much specular we have. And uh, let's see what happens if I just multiply all the speculars by it. I mean, ideally I should change also the not only the amplitude of the specular law, but also its shape, you know, because the wider it is, the more energy it will have. So we want less specular. Basically, you have to compensate one with the other, but it's fine. We are going to just um, ignore it for now and just modulate the amplitude. Um, OK. So that looks great. So what we had before is equivalent of having specular of one and now I am modulating it a little although it feels to be a bit like too much I'm gonna add a bit less of that okay I like what I see here how it breaks a bit um, I think I'm gonna leave it like that. I don't think we need a lot more than than that. Um, you know, I think um, I think I'm good enough with the look of this. I think next time, next thing we can improve performance and motion blur and things like that, and start converging to the final image. But before that, let's see. I'm gonna take a few questions if there are. I'm cool though. Um, given the volume of people in the chat today, I don't think we will have many questions, but I will open it and take a small break, drink some water to wait for your questions. And if there are not many, then we will keep going. All right, let me know. So there, there were already a couple of questions uh, waiting there from Marvin. He says, do you usually use the POW function to make the light reflection more focused? And um, for point lights, I do. Uh, point lights or directional lights, like a sun, I do. And I think that's the most physically correct thing to do. Um, not only the traditional computer graphics Lighting models, those who design them, they already observed that empirically, I guess, that a power function works well. But I think the last PVR work 
has well you know what not really i was gonna say that even today people still use it but i think some people use it those who are stick to physically based fung still do um i think many people are using uh the ggx specular reflection lobe instead of a pow function based one which has a how do you say like a longer tail which means that the specular falls off quickly like in a pow function but then sticks around for a longer time and uh, people like that visually you could achieve that as well with two pow functions you know take the same specular and make it pow 32 for the main part and then make it pow 8 to make it wi much wider then you make it smaller as well and you add them together two pow functions instead of all those divisions and things i guess if they are using ggx is because it resembles measurements of real materials perhaps in that case it's a division with some offsets and stuff but i mean to be honest for shader toy for the kind of things we are doing pow function works just great with the benefit that often enough if you are using a pow 32 or pow 64 or pow 16 you can approximate that by a few multiplications so that's for point lights and directional lights for area lights like the one we are faking in the top light here which is a disc um, smooth stepping uh, a reflection helps both focusing the specular and you know faking the blurriness of the of the reflection so yeah i don't know i go with pow yes i mean and when i say i go with pow is in this context of shader toying if i was in a film studio or a game studio i would go with the uh, with a trend and do a ggx yeah doesn't matter the other question was how do you think the sigmoid or the hyperbolic tangent would work as smooth step alternatives yeah i think they would probably work just fine at least for color correction kind of thing um yeah yeah uh, sigmoid is like a what is it that's like exponential divided by one plus exponential or something and hyperbolic tangent there are many i mean actually i think i explored some um let me see if i go to here um if i go to my profile inverse smooth step let me see non-polynomial smooth step um i have this other one which is neither uh sigmoid well sigmoid is a general general term right for anything that has kind of that shape i think it's not particularly that one over one plus exponential formulation in particular but um i have this other one which is just based on pow functions and it's an alternative to a polynomial smooth step or to a hyperbolic tangent and it has some nice properties in particular i think it was that the inverse of this function is the same function with the parameter inverted which is great like inverting a smooth step for example is difficult because it's a cube function a cubic polynomial so inverting it requires some uh, cubic function cubic equation solver uh, which i did it's also here a smooth inverse smooth step but you know the inverse of a smooth step the one we just derived the x squared times 3 minus 2x the inverse is the sine of the arc sine of this thing over three it's like trisecting an angle and then it's complicated um probably the sigmoid is very easy to invert i imagine this one as well uh, it has a nice symmetry in that respect and you can control the shape as you can see there you can go from anything that is pure identity to a very sharp and strong uh, kind of sigmoid shape or a gain shape anyway yeah you can use anything i suppose um, normally actually those um color profile functions that I was talking about in actual films they are normally stored in lookup tables they are not even uh, a mathematical function per se you can approximate it with a polynomial I guess by some interpolation techniques or whatever but it's just numbers so yeah uh, there are no more questions so let's keep going what's next um, Oh, this is the original shader, the final one, the one I published, the one we are going towards, but we are still here. Um, 
So actually, yeah, comparing to the final picture that I published, you can see the inner core is red. So let's do that because actually it actually brings a nice accent to the whole picture right now. Uh, another thing you want to do, you know, besides making sure the lighting is helping understand the picture and making it easier to interpret, the other thing you want to do is to make sure the, there is a, a focus point, that you are helping people not only understand the picture, but also focus on the thing that you want them to focus on, the part that is important, or at least guide them their view. In this case, we want them to look straight at the middle of the picture. We don't want them to be so much focused on the reflections or whatever. I mean, in this case, this is about example, this shader, because there is not much to look around, <laughs> nothing much to look other than the thing itself, because it's floating in the void, but if you have different elements in the background and you wanted to bring the attention to the very center, colorizing the center in a different color, a salient color, like red, which all humans in all cultures always means, look here, you know, that's why alerts and stop signs and all these things are red. Uh, in China, red means good luck. Red is a powerful color, so let's make that center a bit more red in order to bring the eyes there. We're gonna, I'm gonna totally hack it, and I believe that's how I did it in the final shader as well, where instead of introducing material IDs and you know selecting the sphere through a different ID than the rest of the objects and using that to colorize, I'm going to just, in this case it's simple enough, I'm going to just colorize procedurally based on the distance to the origin. So that sphere is the closest thing to the, ob to the origin, so let's use that coincidence to segmentate it away from the rest and colorize it. So we are going to mix uh, the material with a very red color. And I don't know what the color might be for now, but and um, yeah, let's do, let's do a step function. It's not my fault. Let's do a small step. Not my favorite thing, but uh, zero point. I don't know what how big that is. I'm gonna guess zero point one for now. And we have the length to the origin already, so let's see. Um, actually, don't we want this to be one minus the thing? I think we do. Okay, point one is not big enough. Point two. Okay, there it is. But now it is too much. So it is not point. You know what? Let's look it up. <laughs> we made that sphere ourselves, so we should know how big it was. Point 0.12. There it is. No need to guess. Now, we could decide to put that in a define or a const expression or something, so we can share the value, and in case we ever change the size of the sphere at the center, the right color shows up and the thing propagates properly. Um, but we are going to do none of that. We are just going to hard code the value here, call it done, and keep moving. We will never touch that sphere again in our lifetime, I promise. Okay, um, what else? Is that a good color? I think it's too bright, isn't it? Um, what about something like that, and like that, and like that. Okay. Something closer to what we got in the end. Sort of like it. Maybe a bit brighter. Uh, uh, um, seven, three, two, uh, twenty-five, fifteen. Okay. That's better. Okay. Now performance. Performance, performance, performance. Um, I mean, it's running at 60 FPS here, but I have a small window. It's only 12,000 pixels, 1,200 pixels wide, and I have a GTX, uh, like a huge <laughs> graphics card. I want this to work on mobile phones as well. So right now we are using a 4x multi sampling. We are every pixel is being sampled four times the area of the pixel. It's sampled four times in a regular grid. So we are casting four rays per pixel. Uh, well, there's a the shadow rays too, but anyway, you get it. Uh, let's do it much bigger until we start hitting performance issues in my computer. Okay, there we go. Dash three also trigger. 
Yeah, okay. So let's go with this one. 4x, so I'm sampling 16, 16 times per pixel. Um, and I'm starting to see performance issues, right? So, I mean, eventually we will publish it with 2x, but again, 4x, sorry, 16x in my machine is probably equivalent to 2x, uh, well, 4x in a mobile phone or whatever. Uh, so, first thing to do is, uh, as you know, the expensive part here is the ray marching, it's not the lighting. It's the ray marching as in the primary ray intersection and the shadow ray. So, we are going to do some bounding volumes for this. And this is where I had some math that I wanted to do. So, we are going to surround the whole structure with a sphere, which is a great <laughs> bounding shape for this one because this structure is pretty much a sphere. So we will use a sphere, and if the ray does intersect the sphere, then we will go ahead and do a ray march uh, to find the actual intersection of the ray with the sphere, with the structure. But if the ray misses the bounding sphere, then we can skip all the ray marching altogether. So we need to find intersections with a sphere. So let's do that. Um, mm -mm. Do I have his math? Let's go again and do math. Oh, actually, I forgot to turn the microphone back after I did the math. I hope you were, you could hear me properly. All right. So, um, yeah, let's do some math. Uh, let's see. We want to do intersection of computer intersection of a sphere. That's not a very good sphere, but whatever, and array. So let's call this C for center, R for radius, uh, and following a bit of shader toy, my shader toy conventions, I'm gonna call this the ray origin and the direction of the ray, ray direction. And we know that sphere is defined by all the points in space X that are at a distance of R from the center. So you know, x minus c um, would be for a point x. Um, x minus c is that distance, and for all the ones that have distances of exactly r, those are all points that belong in the sphere. This thing here is distance in mathematics, right? It's the, the length of a vector. So we can square those two things to kind of avoid square roots, and the equation is still valid. And now we also know that any point in the space or at least the points we are interested in a space are those uh, are along along the ray because the we want to find these points those who belong to the sphere which is captured by this equation and now we need to write another equation that captures the fact that we are interested in the points belonging to the ray as well and the points belonging to the ray are those points x that are you know starting from the ray origin at a given at a given distance t from the in the right direction. So basically, this is going to be t, um, and this is going to be t as well. We are going to have t1 and t2. So all points belonging in the ray and all points belonging in the sphere together, we solve it and we will get the intersection point. So the nice thing is we have x already isolated, so we can just take it, plug it in there, and resolve. So we just plug it in there, r0, 0 plus t times rd minus c square equals radius square. Um, this guy here, r0 minus, uh, minus c, I'm going to call it roc. Is there basically the a position of the ray, ray origin relative to the center of the sphere. So roc plus t rd squared equals the radius square. So now we can just go ahead and the square of two things is the first thing squared plus the second one squared sorry plus two times one times the other um, times when you multiply vectors in this case it means the dot product of course equals radius square. So let's simplify a few things here. First of all, there's nothing to be simplified on this one, but we can move the r to that side. 
and then uh, this is a scalar and this is a vector. So the length of a vector times the scalar is just, we can take the scalar out basically. And then what we are left with is, um, is Rd, the length of Rd is squared, but Rd is the direction of the ray, which is normalized. So its length is one and one squared is one. So we don't need to add anything there. And then here we can take T, which is a scalar out of the dot product. And then we have ROC Rd equals zero because we moved R squared to the other right. So this is a quadratic equation um, because we have T squared and T and a constant. So we can solve it. So if we call this thing, as, you know, this is equivalent to A T squared plus B T plus C equals zero with A equals one in this case, B equals two times uh, this dot product and C the constant term is ROC squared minus radius square. So in this case, then T is going to be uh, two times A, which is one minus B, which is two times ROC RD plus minus a square root. And I'm running out of space. I'm going to do woo, roller coaster here. So B squared is four times R O C R D squared minus four times A, which is one times C. So this is the standard quadratic equation solver. Now, even though it's a standard quadratic equation solver, I recommend to never use a generic quadratic equation solver. You know, I have seen people in Shader Toy making all this math great up to this point where A, B, and C have been identified and then they call something like solve quadratic and they pass A, B, C and then they get T back, which is mathematically correct, but it's a pity that they did all this work and they kind of um, didn't push it to the final line in that if you actually not don't call the solver blindly as a black box, but replace ABC in the quadratic solver, you see there are things that cancel out and simplify. In this case, there's a four and a four, which can be taken as a common factor. So it will be the square root of four times that, plus that minus that. The four as a common factor can be taken out of the square root as a number two, because square root of four is two. And then you have a two, a two, and a two as common factors, all of which simplify with each other. So basically, this two, this two, this four, and this four simplify and go away, which means there's nothing on the denominator but a one, which already means we are skipping a division. So not only we are like, you know, finding a more, more elegant solution mathematically, and you will see why, but also we are making the code more efficient. There's no divisions to be done. So what we get is ROCRD plus minus square root of that guy there, which is the same as that one, minus four times ROC square minus R square. Sorry, no four. There we go. Now I'm going to call this in the code. I will call it B, not to be confused with that. And I'm going to call this guy C, um, which does match that one. But yeah, basically we have this now uh, in the code. So yeah, it's great. It's much more simplified than call calling the generic solver and, and makes me happy. It means we are, it means this guy here and this guy here have some geometrical meaning because we know the solutions need, uh, the solutions to this equation or the intersections will happen only if the square root can be evaluated, which means all the things inside of it are positive, the discriminant as they call it. And the fact that the discriminant needs to be positive now has an interpretation once we have plugged all the actual geometrical elements into it because RD, ROC, and R are geometrical 
uh, objects, you know, radius, distances, and orientations. And now you could analyze, okay, if this needs to be positive for a solution to exist, it means the ray cannot be uh, looking away from the sphere kind of interpretations. And that's true. So, you know, by not using a generic solver, I think you can learn a lot of the problem and gain intuitions. And also, as I was saying, making it more optimal. So let's move to the code. Um, and, and this time I moved the microphone back to where I was. And we are going to implement a, a sphere intersector. Uh, I'm going to write it somewhere up here. Uh, we are going to return two floats because we want two solutions, T1 and T2 in the drawing, which are the entry and exit points of the ray with the sphere, if any. Um, I for intersection, sphere for sphere. <laughs> Couldn't be more clear. I'm sorry for my cryptic names. Um, but they work for me and for many people, actually, more than you might think. That's why I'm using them. Center of the sphere and a radius. So we said that the first thing we would do is to do the ray origin relative to the center of the sphere. That's the first thing we did in the code, uh, in the math. Let me show it to you. That thing was done. Uh, where did we do that? Here. I'm subtracting RC, R, R, O from, sorry, I'm subtracting the center of the sphere from RO to make the ray origin relative. So that's what I'm doing here. And then we said B is going to be the dot product of RD and RO. And C is going to be the dot product of RO, RO minus radius square. Uh, let me check that. That is here, B. Remember, we removed the two of it. So this thing is B, and this is C. So ROC squared times uh, minus R squared. And uh, RO squared is just the dot product of RO by itself. You know, something multiplied by itself, it's squared. Now, the thing inside of the square root uh, discriminant is B times B minus C. So normally this would be like p squared minus 4ac, but again, we simplified the 4, the a equals 1. You know, if we were computing a, this would be rd i rd, but as we said, rd has unit length, so the dot product of a vector by itself with unit length is still 1, so we don't need it. But look how pretty this is. This is like dot rd rd, dot rd ro, dot ro ro. There is something here, right? something normally when there's a symmetry in the code or something that looks regular it means there is something to be learned about the regularity um, of the objects this thing represent in space basically the geometry here uh, there is some logic to it it's not like we could guess we could learn about the logic if we want it right now we are just applying the quadratic equation blindly but as i was saying before you can think about it and actually you can use some of the learnings you might do by looking at the geometry to optimize the things such as when the ray is not facing the sphere, you don't even need to try to intersect it and things like that. But for now, we are going to just um, take it easy and say if the inside part of the square root is negative, just return negative 1 as intersection points. Uh, this will be flag flagging the user of this function, telling, telling it I, I didn't find any intersections. But if we did, we take the square root and then we return you know, as we said, minus b minus h. And because the square root can be positive or negative, the other one is going to be minus b plus h. So again, going back to the math, uh, minus b plus minus h. So that's what we are doing there. And compile. We did no mistakes. OK, let's use it to bound our sphere. Remember that we are rendering at 26 frames per second. Let's see if we can get that to improve. So our mobile users will be ha uh, can be happy. So before intersecting, B for bounding volume. Um, let's call it vol to keep with the three letters tradition that I never follow because I'm using RO and RD. But let's stick to three letters when we can. Our guy is centered at the origin. Radius, I don't know yet. 
we will have to look it up. But what we do know is that if the we got minus ones, um, we didn't find an intersection point. Now from T zero and sorry T one and T two, there is a case where we could get a negative value in T one and still be a valid intersection. Meaning if we are inside of the sphere and we shoot the ray from the inside, we would still hit two points, one behind us backwards because the ray is infinitely long in both directions, but the backwards one we don't care because we are only shooting forward. But we will still get a mathematically valid intersection point behind us, meaning T1 would be negative, while T2, which is in front of us, would still be positive because we will be hitting one of the walls of the sphere in front of us. Um, so there's that case in, what, in which T1 is negative but still valid. But there is no case where T2 is negative and we get an intersection because if we are inside, T2 is positive always. If we are outside and we hit the sphere, there is always an exit point, in which case T2 is positive, but there is never negative. It only If we get a negative T2, it means the sphere is behind us. So, you know, if T2, which is the Y component of this vector that we are returning, T1 is X and T2 is Y, if that's negative, we can escape. But if it's positive, then we have an intersection with the sphere, then we need to remarch. Uh, compile, I see that the image didn't break, which is good. Now, we can optimize a few things though, uh, as well. For example, before we were remarching up to two units, two meters or whatever. And that was an arbitrary value that I chose such that we wouldn't see clipping. You know, if I make this thing too small, there we go, we start seeing clipping because we are not remarching far enough in space to find intersections with the back side of the structure. So I just made it big enough that it would capture the whole structure, but not too long so it wouldn't uh, remarch forever to infinity and drop performance. But now we don't need to guess what that maximum distance is because now we know the whole thing is contained within the sphere. So we never need to remarch farther than the outer uh, than the exit point of the ray with the sphere intersection. So this is gonna be this is going to be always vol.y. We never need to remarch farther than the outer point, the outer intersection point. And similarly for the starting point, um, when we are inside of the sphere, we need to start remarching from the camera location. But when we are outside as we are now, all the traversal of empty space from our camera location to the bounding volume to the sphere in this case, all that is wasted very much because we know we won't find anything outside of the bounding sphere. So we can as well just start remarching from the edge, from the boundary of the sphere itself. So all we need to do in theory is to start remarching from vol.x, from vol.x to vol.y, right? From the inner, um, from the entry point to the exit point, except for when we are inside of the sphere, in which case, if we were starting from the entry point, we would be starting from a point behind us, which is not good. It's not good. We want to start from the camera location. So this guy is actually, we want to start from the max of uh, the camera location and the volume. Anyway, so here we are. Um, I don't know. I think the sphere was about 5.5 units big, so it's bigger than 0.5. I am trying to find now the um, bounding sphere that is big enough to bound it completely without intersecting it. So I will say 0.54, although I remember it was 0.53. Okay, let's see. If we go to the gears, and this is the slicing. If you remember from the previous video, the gears are kind of infinitely long cylinders and then we slice it. And the slicing is happening at 0.5 and then with a thickness of 0 0.03 and a rounding effect of 0 0.05. So this is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.05, which is, um, this goes there and this goes there. So this is our radius actually. So the guess we had was not too far. So it's there. Okay. So 
that's our sphere performance didn't improve much yet um, and now okay I have a few questions in the chat we will go through them in a bit and I'm gonna apply the same trick for the soft shadow computation so in this case uh, as we said this is the mean of volume.x and this is going to be the max to um, volume.y oh something got broken t max mean and max and i did an error where here this should be oh yeah it's a max okay all right so where are we with performance? Still 30, nothing improved. Uh, I think it's because the browser is um, synchronizing the refresh rate to 60 Hertz. So the only options after 60 is 30, which is also multiple. Okay, let me do a test where we do super sampling of three by three. So we got 43 FPS and I'm going to remove the bonding volumes. I want to see, basically, <laughs> I wanted to do an uh, with and without bonding volumes uh, to show a performance improvement. And I'm sure it does. Another thing is, can we measure it with a, Web G with a WebGL setup where, you know, the browser is not really made for real-time graphics yeah 36 40 fps it's kind of the same performance well let's put it all back to where it was so shadows it might as well be that they have a bug although the fact that the rendering is correct is kind of telling me we did everything right oh it could also be OBS limiting things for me and so on. Um, anyway, guys, we optimize things, believe me. <laughs> In a normal setup, uh, where this runs on the mobile phone, the difference would be big. And it is normally. Anyways, uh, what else can we do? Uh, let's add some motion blur like we did with the... Okay, there were some questions, actually. Let's take them and then we continue. Uh, where do I have my chat? Here. Mm. Are the colors converted to sRGB? Uh, well, they are converted from um, linear space to gamma space, which is what you want. You don't really want to convert to sRGB. sRGB is a compression format. It's not so much color space or anything. So when you are storing colors in a texture, sRGB is great or in an intermediate buffer. For display, you want to be in gamma space. But the confusion comes from the fact that sRGB, the sRGB compression curve and the gamma curve are very similar. They almost overlap. Uh, but I'm using the gamma curve in this case because I have a monitor. I'm displaying on a monitor which will have gamma uh, baked into its response for you know how the light hits the, the LEDs or whatever. And so yeah, I'm converting everything back to gamma or sRGB if you want to if we want to speak on the language of your question. So yes, we are. Um, I even even didn't even mention it because uh, every shade that I write right from the beginning, I put the conversion of color at the, the color conversion at the end. So anything I do, any artistic decisions in terms of lighting, materials, and colors are already considering taking in consideration what the output is going to look like. Um, you don't want to find yourself in a place where you tweaked or are directed things only to discover that you forgot to do your final color correction thing, at the, well, color space thing at the end, and then you have to remake all the art. So yeah. And the other question, uh, yeah, you're thinking of gamma space, yeah. I do the mistake all the time as well myself, sRGB and gamma. It's not a mistake, it's more like um, it has been so embedded in the way we think about graphics that 
we almost use them interchangeably interchangeably <laughs> what's that word in english like you know uh, yeah we use one or the other almost like they were the same thing and the other one is excuse me question yeah don't ex don't excuse anything that's where we are here uh but i heard that we should use we should not use if in a shader as both execution paths need to be evaluated anyway okay we 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 <laughs> we were discussing this in twitter just two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago, um, where there is a lot of misconceptions about this issue. And I was in a war <laughs> against the, this misconception and trying to explain people that that is not true or it is not true necessarily or it is complicated. Um, I would say that what people do of, you know, because they assume that the GPU will evaluate both branches of an if, they kind of evaluate both anyways, and then they do a mix based on a step function that kind of encodes the um, condition. And that's wrong, I mean, no, that's lower, that's way slower than using a, a, an if statement or a conditional move. So, let me see. If you're doing something simple, like if, a is bigger than B, then the result is C, otherwise it's D, you know, like something like um, um, something like, you know, if A bigger than B, so let's say color, uh, 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 I will do fast, I don't want to spend too much time on this, that color is white, otherwise color equals B. Are ternary operators quicker than using an equivalent if else? Yes, depends. So let me go through this. Um, I mean, these are constants, it doesn't matter. But if you have something like that, for example, uh, first of all, the compiler almost surely will convert this to a ternary operator. Um, you should check. Never believe anything I say. The compiler does weird things. but. This is in principle slower, but normally will be converted to the faster version of it, which is the ternary thing. And that it's not an if statement. So this is a conditional move, which the hardware can do in silicon. This is not internally compiled as in, you know, um, CMP, like compare A and B. This is not uh, CMP AB if uh, greater than uh, zero, then jump, or whatever. It is, it, it is nothing like that. This is just a CMove, CMove operation where, you know, call one and, one and zero. So conditional moves are fast. The hardware is ready to do that. It doesn't break branch prediction. It doesn't stall the pipeline. Uh, it doesn't do any of those bad things. So this is super far, super fast. So if you ever find yourself doing something like mix, you know, the black color with the white color best based on the step of A and B. This is slow because now you're making a step function, which is a ternary operation. And then you are doing a mix, which is multiplying and adding and subtracting. So you are introducing arithmetic to something that is not needed because you can just select one or the other with a CMOF operation. So that one is clear. Don't do the mix step thing, even though I know blocks and GLSL tutorials and books and the misconception is everywhere it used to be true maybe in, in 2007 but we are like you know decade and a half from there so or whatever it is but it's a long time that thing long time ago became not true anymore but blogs are still around these kind of things stick they're very sticky so i am trying to send mails to those blogs that i find that are spreading the wrong information but well, okay, so that's the C move versus step, and then there is the if conditional. So that depends a lot. Uh, if there is lar large amounts of work to be skipped, use an if, because no, both sides of the if won't be evaluated. Hardware these days can take branches. The only penalty is if from all the shading group, which means, as you know, the GPU is rendering in groups of pixels, like every eight by 16 pixels or eight by eight or whatever, all those pixels, uh, are running the same shader in lockstep. They have one program, program counter and they all, as a team, 
advanced in the shading program. Uh, so if from those 60, um, 64 pixels or 128 pixels or whatever, they all, half of them have to take one of the sides of the branch and the other ones have to take the other, then as a group, surely, they will both have to take um, both branches. They will have to wait for each other. So the cost is the same as if you were evaluating both branches, I guess. But if your group of 8 by 8 pixels, they all happen to be evaluating the, con evaluating the condition and returning the same value, they all can skip the whole branch. So in this case, for the sphere, we are going to skip a lot of work, a whole remarching, remarch re process, and all the pixels around the sphere, which all as a group are not touching the sphere, they will all of them skip that expensive remarching branch of the if statement. All the pixels inside of the sphere, or far enough from the edge of the sphere, will also do the same. They will evaluate the remarch. Um, it's only those group of tiles of 8 by 8 pixels around the edge of the projection of the sphere in the screen that will waste a bit of resources. But overall, it's a big win. So yes, if statements help, use them when appropriate. Think about replacing them with a conditional move. If you can, if it makes sense, sometimes doing the uh, step thing helps. Measure, measure it and see, but yeah, don't program based on preconceptions that often are false and just test it and try and yes, be, be okay with ifs. So if you want to program something, just write it with an if because you know it works and only if you want to optimize and start considering other options, but don't avoid it just by principle because yeah. Then there is, of course, if something can be done with a max function or a mean function instead of an if thing is less than zero, then equals zero, or if thing is bigger than blah, make it blah. Use mean and max because those are also implemented in, in the silicon. Uh, I do believe it's uh, an operation, like adding or subtracting numbers or multiplying. It's not just a list of micro instructions or anything. Anyway, use ifs. Yeah. Um, and why was talking about this? Because, um, yeah, we had a question, but um, let's keep going. Sorry for that super in-depth, uh, almost a bit, felt a bit like a lecture. I don't like giving lectures because I'm the one, I myself learning all the time and trying things. Actually, speaking of trying things, like I'm not believing what other people tell you, which you shouldn't, um, I think I have a shader which tests this exactly. Um, um, what is it called? Uh, I have too many shaders and now I won't find it. Analyzing metric. Uh, give me one more, 20 more seconds. I will find it. Uh, conditionals maybe? No. Condi um, branching, no. Oh, I'm really bad at naming my shaders, I guess. I do have a shader where it computes something in five different ways with uh, if, with conditional move or ternary operator, with steps, with multiplies, and uh, the if, and I will, f it's somewhere there. I will try to find it uh, another time, but. Um, the if turned to be the fastest, the ternary operator, way faster than the step and the mix. So yeah, measure things and don't trust anyone. Uh, all right, so let's do motion blur, which we already did for, I think, in the stream for the yellow guy. But let's do one more, uh, once more and um, apply it to this shader. So the first thing I'm going to do is to replace the time uh, variable that is controlling all the animation by my own, so we can um, tweak it. So by default, time is going to be i time. And now the trick is, of course, because we are sampling multiple times, we can take also not offsets inside the area of the pixel to implement super sampling. We can also take samples at different moments in time so that we can kind of mimic exposure, I guess, of a film where the light is coming to the to the film 
and it's capturing a whole interval of time, not just a instantaneous state of reality. It's capturing a whole sequence of moments. So we can do that by subtracting some amount, and the amount we are going to subtract is the exposure, like how much time is the film exposed to light, how much of the lens or the or the sensors of, the, of your digital camera, for how long are they open to capturing light coming to them uh, before they close and you move on to the next frame, to capture in the next frame. And normally that's called the, sh the, the aperture, the, no, sorry, the shutter speed. It's normally measured in degrees because of the old days when the cameras had a spinning disc with a hole in it that would, you know, the film is here, the light is coming from there, and there's this thing in between blocking the light and it has a hole in it, so light can go through and then start spinning, so the uh, the light is being blocked because the disc is solid until the the whole turn is done and the hole, uh, the gap again, aligns with the you know light film uh, direction and then the film gets exposed again. So depending on, so that thing would rot spin once every twenty fourth of a second to capture to give you know to give twenty four exposures. Uh, of the film to the light per second to get 24 frames per second, but the, la the 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 hole could be of different sizes. So if it was just the size big enough that the whole uh, film was exposed once, then you would get very sharp images with no motion blur. And the bigger the hole, the longer time the light would be falling into the film, and the blurrier the image would get because objects would normally move in front of the camera. Now, the proportion of this how big the hole is relative to the whole size of the disc is the, the, the shutter angle, which is like if it's 180 degrees, like the disc is half, only blocking half of the time. The, the gap is 180 degrees big. It could be 45, it could be different sizes. Normally films use 180 degrees, which means for the 1 24th of a second that takes to make a frame, half of that, like 1 48th, the film is exposed. So. Long explanation, just to say that I'm going to use 148, <laughs> which is um, <clears throat> implementing a shutter angle of 180 degrees. And now we need a, num a number that goes from 0 to 1. So I'm going to use um, something like, so we have m times, so m and n are the two dimensional indexes of the a by a you know, the 2x2 two two or 4x4 four four sampling pattern that we are doing. So I'm going to just use that. And get a number that goes from 0 to A times A. A times A. And, um, um, yeah, and, and use that to basically to, to get a signal from 0 to 1 that gives me different sampling points along the interval. So... Yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple. I made a mistake somewhere, so... Actually, I can only do one float here. I don't need all that. All right. So we got motion blur now. It's difficult to say. Now, despite everything I said, <laughs> I'm going to fake the exposure by a lot so we can see what's going on. Okay, there we go. So I made, it, I made the exposure 10 times longer than but it really is in a film, in a film like in the theater when you go there. So now you can see, let me do it even a bit smaller perhaps. You can see the motion blur pretty well there. It's really forced, like you would never have this in a real camera, but it can help us debug stuff. So beautiful there. Um, what we can do is knowing that this will go you not know, with 16, 16x multi-sampling, which is four by four, but with something more like four X multi-sampling, or two by two, because we will publish this for uh, in Shader Toy for people to use from iPads to mobile phones to desktops, and not everyone has a GeForce 2080 like I have. So this is more realistic of what we are going to publish. So this motion blur, although it is exaggerated, and we see all this banding, I think we can make it better. And I think I think we did it as well in the yellow happy jumping shader where we added some dithering to this uh, sampling pattern. Now we have the exposure and we are breaking it in even time intervals and sampling or rendering the whole thing once for every one of those 
uh, points in time, but we can shift those around based on the pixel coordinates. So every pixel in the screen has slightly different location for those time intervals. Uh, so that will introduce noise in the picture, but it will blur, um, I will dither, I guess is the word, um, the motion blur. So I'm gonna call it D for dither. It's gonna be a value that goes from zero to one and I will add it here. So actually this is gonna become a bit more like a stratified sampling where we have a regular set of intervals and then we randomize the offsets inside of it. And this is gonna be a signal that goes from zero to one. Um, and it has to depend on the pixel coordinates. I'm gonna make something up. And I think I always use kind of the same thing. So I'm just, I'm sure that um, I use something like that as well for the final shader. You know, I don't know, I'm gonna make some numbers there. And we don't want a thing to go from zero to one. So I just took a sign of the Y coordinate pixel times blah and multiplied it with the X coordinate of the pixel times blah. And I used the sign of both. So this will create numbers that go from negative one to one. In theory, this is gonna create a periodic pattern, of course, because we are just doing sign of X times something, but these frequencies are so big that um, if you know, you know, sampling theory and Nyquist uh, from signal processing, you know if you are sampling higher than twice the frequency of the signal, then you get aliasing. So basically we are creating aliasing here for this signal, not for the picture, just for this signal of sine waves. And aliasing looks a lot like noise. And that's great because what we want is noise. Uh, ideally we want blue noise or we want, uh, but for this case, we can just go with semi randomly looking noise or whatever we are generating. Actually, we can we can have a look to what this looks like. So if I go here and I do tot equals this, okay, this is the signal we are creating. I don't know how this will come through the stream and the MP4 compression, but what I see in my screen right now is a set of uh, dots. It's pretty regular. It's a pretty regular pattern, but you know, I'm fine with it um, because um, it is helping me blur the image. Look, if I didn't have that, the motion blur is super, you can see the bands in it. With it, the bands are gone. You can see a bit of a pattern, but that's much better. Also, remember that here we really exaggerated our motion blur uh, exposure, but normally it's just 1 24th of a second. So we won't really, see much of a problem. So there it is. This is our uh, motion blur. Uh, the other thing I'm going to add is um, I'm going to add some dithering. I don't know how much of the background you can see. Let me make this. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see that again. I don't know how the uh, stream compression is treating our pictures here, but here locally in my screen, I see a lot of banding in the in the background, especially. You know, there's this uh, gray background, which has a small gradient. I'm gonna make it brighter. And I definitely see banding in it, like uh, color bands. I don't know if you can see it yourself, but this is due to, because you know, this is all floating point values, but in the end of the day, the screen is probably using just eight bits for display. Um, well, maybe not the screen, but probably the browser is baking everything into an 8-bit buffer, RGB8. So that's creating some problems for smooth changing signals like the background where you're going to definitely see the jumps between one level to the next. Actually, I think we can... Um, uh, let me think. Yeah, I think we should be able to see it if I do... Okay, let's take measurements and see if we see the banding. If, I'm gonna try to recreate the banding um, for us to see that the, dither, that the dithering, dithering that I'm going to implement works. So first of all, let's find jumps on the pixel colors. Uh, okay, I don't see the banding on the background. Oh, it's because I'm working on floating point values. So I'm gonna mimic the eight bits of the screen by um, 
you know, multiplying the colors by 255, taking the, in the, absolute, uh, the closest integer and then divided by 255. Okay. Let's make this bigger. Okay, so that's the banding. I hope you can see that. So, uh, so this code here is kind of mimicking what the screen is doing to me, not to you, because OBS is probably capturing, well, OBS should be also capturing from an 8-bit buffer. Anyway, in case you wouldn't see the banding, um, this proves that it is there, and I can see it for sure. So let's do dithering to see if we can hide it. Uh, so the dithering is going to be the last thing that happens before we display, we send a picture to the 8-bit buffer. Before we quantize our signal, we dither it. So after color correction, after everything, here's where we do the, dither the dithering. And I'm not going to be too sophisticated. I'm going to just use, actually, you know what? Why don't we use the same uh, stuff that we use for the motion blur? Something like, I'm going to change the numbers a bit. Well, actually, I'm going to just rotate it 90 degrees. I want to decouple it. I want to decouple the dithering from the motion blur random numbers so they don't interfere with each other and create some pattern or something. But basically, we have that, but we only want to add noise of an amplitude which is uh, one pixel wide, I guess. Okay. Um, so let me go here. Original image as we had it. And I definitely see the banding here. It's pretty clear in my monitor. Uh, if I add the dithering, banding is gone. Um, again, this might be a bit boring for you guys if uh, the stream is not <laughs> kind of showing you the banding, but if we see this artificial banding enha enhancement, you can see that this is the banding so this is points where those lines pixels is where I, in my screen, I'm seeing big changes of color. And with the dithering, I'm, coming, I'm kind of spreading that transition uh, from a line to cover more pixels. So basically the error or the errors or the transitions diffuse over the screen pixels. They go a bit everywhere and that becomes more of a visual noise than um, these kind of bands. And we all know that. I mean, this is a very well known fact that we all like noise better than we look, that we like banding. So that's great. Uh, what else can we do here? Let's do a bit of uh, vignetting. Uh, let's do something where vignetting is this effect. I mean, it's just aesthetic. Helps a bit sometimes for focusing viewers' attention to the thing, to the center of the screen. But um, I still feel like I'm sometimes overusing it. I don't like per se. I, I don't like doing dither, uh, sorry, vignetting and color aberration and, and film grain per se, because I think these are cheap ways to try to improve your image by using artifacts that no longer exist. It's like people who add the the vinyl, vinyl, vinyl. How you pronounce the old records? You know, before CDs and DVDs, they had this kind of noise, and people still today with perfectly clean digital sounds, they add that sound on top of the main track to give it a nostalgia effect. But I guess that only works for people my age. Those kids, the kids these days don't know what that sound is. So this is a bit similar to me where adding grain and all those things is makes it cool, look cool for people who were used to those kind of things in the films, but I don't think we should use it anymore. Anyways, the only one that I still use sometimes is the vignetting, which is an, one of those artifacts from old technology. But I use it because it helps artistically a bit to focus the viewer's attention to the center of the screen. So just take the, the distance from the pixel to the center and um, uh, wait a second. Um, we are, is this correct? P is negative one to one. Oh, I have to change call color. That's why I was confused. Ah, that's what I expect. So the white stuff is because I'm creating negative numbers. But now here we go. 
here you can see while the center of the image still is bright now the edges are getting darker so that's cool all i did is take the distance from every pixel to the center of the screen well the length the distance squared just like we did in the case of the sphere maths where the square of a vector is just the dot product of the vector with itself just um and i'm using that to basically darken the colors by 20 percent, i guess and i think we are done uh i mean we could have animation but i miss it we have him here for two hours and a half almost um let's do another quick look to the chat and let me know if you want to go and do animation because if you remember the final piece is doing this kind of funny morph thing where the different pieces of the gears appear and disappear so we can try to do that again um you let me know in the meanwhile let's see what there is on the chat um boom, boom, boom. Xiao is asking is it worth calculating bounds for the bonding volumes i guess earlier and passing the value into functions um i don't know it should be the same i guess um i don't think it would have any performance difference um i'm not an expert on how glsl code in shader toy gets converted to directx uh, which is what is running under the hood of this um, it's not OpenGL, even though WebGL has the GL thing on it. It's really DirectX that is happening, at least for me, in Windows. And But I, I suspect that the translation code is just taking all the functions and inlining them. I don't think the final code that is that the GPU runs has any function calls. There's no call or jump or anything. It's just all a huge inlined stream of instructions so every, all the functions get in line and that's the reason that sometimes shaders take so long to compile because a for loop will be in line every iteration of the loop will create a huge amount of code and that's why some shaders take like a minute to compile until we have the creators fix it and do tricks to prevent the compiler from, unro from unrolling it but if i was computing the sphere intersection outside of the raycast function and then passing the values it would be the same as doing it inside i don't think I think the code that is generated is the same. Yeah. And I think we are done. Um, yeah, this is the final shader as it was published. Uh, I think we almost hit it. I think we got a different color for the ball inside, but um, we did a pretty good job at hitting the same look. So that's it. I think we are done. Let me see if there is if there are any questions. Um, not much. Show the URL is to your testing selection conditional. Yes, let's try to find it. Testing conditional testing selection there. Yeah, that's the shader I was talking about for performance. Um, so yeah this is a case where for about 15,000 times per frame per pixel we evaluate some conditional in different ways so this is way to do it with um, a, a ternary operation you know if this condition is fulfilled then this otherwise that conditional move this is uh, with an if you know if this thing happens then that and these two other ways are <laughs> the smart ways as i have it there in quotes where you would do step and then multiplying them together to get an and you know if two things are true um, it's equivalent of one times one so you can multiply them together and if one of them fails it becomes zero the whole thing evaluates to zero and nothing gets added but you are always multiplying doing steps and adding so one of each one of those steps is going to be a ternary condition just like that so you have two of those and a multiplication and an addition so it's going to be slower and so it is uh, the ternary operation gives me 83 frames per second the smart old school way uh, it's much lower it's 57 frames per second 
is another alternative where you can take a conditional and cast it to a floating point value from bool to float and it will become 1.0 if it's true and 0.0 .0 if it's false still quicker than the step functions but still involves a multiplication and an addition meaning still slow 71 frames per second versus 83 and this seems to be this particular test again try your thing your own code but this particular test uh, was faster with conditionals and conditional moves than with step functions both in a laptop and like a pc you know and a, a phone so so it's pretty consistent. Um, anyway, um, we are done for today. I think uh, we will have another live stream soon, um, probably in a few weeks. I want to uh, work again on the hacker, so that's going to be a fun one. And I think that's it. Should we close the stream now? Let's do it. See you next time, guys. And thank you. Okay, forgot. <laughs> I'm so bad at closing things. Um, there. Thank you so much for all the people in this list who are uh, helping me in Patreon and um, giving me a chance to try to dedicate more time to shaders and writing articles in my website and making tutorials and videos and live streams, which I enjoy a lot. So thank you so much for... Uh, helping me and helping and he thank you everyone else as well for being in the stream today that was really really fun and we will have another one soon so see you guys